Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm your host, Eric Quanstrom, the CMO at Science. Today's episode is a really spirited one and fun, fun, fun discussion that I had with Dan Fantasia. Dan is actually the president of Treeline, which is a sales recruiting firm. In fact, they build themselves as the nation's top sales recruiting firm. In fact, they're only concentrating on sales and sales roles. And that's what you'll hear us talk about today is a lot of the challenges, a lot of the market. Um, this is actually very timely. And so we're hitting you in uh, Q1 of 2023 with kind of the state of sales recruiting. And we talk a lot about uh, recruiting into one of the hardest jobs to recruit for, sales development managers or heads of sales development. Um, Dan gives his perspective, his insights on uh, what to look for and, and some of the structures that he uses um, to help candidates, to evaluate them, to give guidance. And so a really informative interview. And I think you're, you're going to get a, a lot out of this. So not just for those um, seeking jobs or thinking about their next career move, this is a, a great uh, podcast for you just to kind of tap the pulse of the recruiting world and get that oh so valuable perspective. So without further ado, here's Dan. And we're back with Dan Fantasia. By the way, I love that name, right? Like that's got to be one of the greatest names in all of sales recruiting. Does it not, Dan? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I guess so. I guess it's uh, memorable. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say. As a marketer, you can almost never forget Dan Fantasia, right? Yeah. Like once you meet you, <laughs> hear you, it's burned on my brain forever. Yeah. Uh, I hope, I hope so. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Maybe it's because Fantasia was maybe the first movie I ever saw as a kid. No, is that right? It is. Wow. Well, you know, it's generational. So um, there's plenty of people that have never seen the movie. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Most, most of the audience. Uh, That's today. probably true. Yeah. The, the reach of Disney is far and wide sometimes. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but where I'd love to dive in. So you've been kind of the uh, the president, founder, principal at Treeline Recruiting for the last two decades. And so you've pretty much seen it all when it comes to supplying businesses with sales talent. And I'd love to get your perspective. Maybe we can open up the discussion really around um, some of the changes that you've seen on the sales landscape over that time. You know, here we are in recording this in 2023. And I think we can all agree that the macroeconomic environment is maybe the weirdest we've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I mean, it, it's so drastic, right? For we've been in business for 22 years and uh, everything's changed. Recruiting's changed. The sales models have changed. It is just a totally different landscape, especially when once COVID hit. And even for us as a company, right? Uh, we were in the office every day, suit and tie, um, meeting candidates face to face, a, a big dynamic bull, you know, bullpen environment and noisy fun, bells ringing, the beer fridges and you know, all of the rest. And we never thought in a million years when COVID hit, we said uh, on Monday of that week, we said, it's not going to affect us. And by, fri by <laughs> Friday, we, <laughs> by Friday, we were saying, you know what? Everybody better take their computer home. <laughs> right. And we never went, Monday came, we never went back and we and adapted, I, we grew and we changed. I should point out that, that you're in the Northeast in or outside of Boston, right? Yeah, right out happened. 10 miles, actually a little less than 10 miles out of the city, right on the technology belt, 128 belt here, 95 belt. So yeah. 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 And Neutron bomb going off in the industry too, right? Like on the other side of the recruiting equation, now how many roles do you recruit for that are hybrid, remote, or fully remote? Um, going you forward? know, uh, it's, it's, it's such a, a great um, question. So we all went hybrid, obviously. We, 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 I'm sorry, we all went remote. We're, we are now a virtual company. We're never going back. And like I said, we, we never thought that would happen, but it did. And it's way better for us, by the way. We have people across the United States that, that, recruit on our team. Um, but, you know, things are changing. They continue to change. So if, if a company right now is a virtual, remote, or hybrid, fine, no problem. But the companies that are requiring individuals to come back to the office, the conversion rate on that 
getting someone excited to go to an office every day is incredibly challenging. So if mm. you don't have a hybrid model, you are at a disadvantage. And if you're forcing your employees to come back to the office, they are calling us. So if you're willing to risk losing some of your top producers, realize this, when they come back to the office, they may be acting as though it's okay, but their resume is probably with a search firm or in your competitor's hands and they're considering options. So, so the real question is, is it worth it to push hard to get the talent back when you may potentially turn over a, a, a decent percentage uh, percentage of those people. Well, and I would think too, the other part of that story is, you know, if you can go remote, you've got an entire 50 states worth of candidates at your disposal and the, the candidate pool is just so much larger, right? Oh, it's, it's actually one of the reasons why we're so much more successful. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I mean we we've been tremendously successful, but when we were able to recruit across the United States, and we didn't have to compete with all of the software companies and technology companies right here in our backyard, um, and, and it wasn't our ability to attract talent. It's just that uh, we're not VC backed. We, you know, we we don't have you know, money coming in, we have to do it. We're privately held. We have to do it and produce every single day and have to be fiscally responsible. If we're not, we're in trouble. So it was challenging for us to compete for the talent pool we wanted at the price point here in Boston that was required. Why don't you talk a little bit about TreeLine itself and, and kind of where you specialize and, and the kinds of sales talent that, that you place? All right. So as you know, we've been around for 22 years. Um, since our inception, we've had an exclusive focus on the recruitment and career advancement of sales professionals. That's everything from SDRs, BDRs, MDRs, w w whatever the terminology you want to use up to a CRO, uh, VP of sales and everything in between. Um, we work in every industry. I mean, we really recruit in every industry except one. We do not work in the business to consumer industry. All opportunities that we represent are B2B. Okay. Um, so if you're a sales individual, a salesperson looking to advance your career, you're, you're really crazy not to be talking to us because we have access to so many opportunities and the service is free of charge for our candidates, right? So if you're a BDR or a SDR or AE looking for a new opportunity, it's always wise to check in with our organization to see what options are out there. And the best time to be looking is when you have runway, right? You, you, you need time. If you wanna be selective in a job search, then you need someone looking for you so that every time a great opportunity comes up where you can make more money and advance your career, someone's telling you about it. If you don't have that kind of connection, then when something not bad happens, but something changes, your manager moves on or the company gets acquired, which if something changes, and you're not prepared, and you don't have those relationships, and now you're forced into finding a new opportunity. Now you're rushed, right, Eric? Yeah. You're, you're like you're making you're not you're making emotional decisions that aren't necessarily always great for your career. Right. Yep. That's a great piece of advice, right there. Don't rush. If you don't, don't rush. To. Yeah. And we know <laughs> when we help people find new opportunities, we have like no turnover, right? It's there's no you you don't want to be forced into an opportunity find a good fit and if you have uh, concerns then don't move forward we'll just keep working with you let's just keep building a pipeline and educating you about new opportunities until you do find the right fit yeah. right it's, if you come to us desperate and you just take you know you need a job that's that's not the ultimate time to be you know working with us if i'm hearing this and and you didn't say this so maybe i'm just kind of assuming things please validate or invalidate this statement um, what I'm hearing is, is like that will actually help you do your job better for placing the right candidates with the right situations, um, short of having a little bit of that desperation and, or kind of like willingness to say yes, otherwise. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. I mean, we're, we're so transparent when we, when we're bringing candidates and companies together, um, you know, you, you want to make sure it's a good match culturally. You want to make sure that uh, the, the, your social selling style aligns with the selling style of the organization. You might be transactional or you might be strategic. I mean, there's, there's just different personality sets. Anyway, our goal is to make sure it's a good match. And that, that's all we care about. The, the worst, you know what the worst feeling is? 
is if you um, you you are working with a candidate, you're super excited excited about an opportunity, like genuinely excited about an opportunity. And the person takes the opportunity, you disrupt their career, and six months later it doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is the worst, Eric. That is like, I mean, you know, we've been around for a long time and we've had a tremendous amount of success. I would say we're one of the largest in our business. Um, in, in that is sales exclusive, you know, yeah. uh, search. Um, but one of the ways we built such a great brand is because we really find, you know, a good match. Like that feels good. Uh, we don't care about the, the fee and the, you know, what matters most is helping people find the right opportunity and helping the company find the right person. If you can do that, oh, it feels really good. Really yeah. good. Yeah. It's that proverbial one plus one equals three. Um, I'd love to get a sense too, since we were talking about it and hint, hint, everyone in the audience should be going to tree line and kind of developing a relationship here yeah. um, after listening <laughs> to this podcast, but give me a sense of what you think about and, and ballpark ranges is fine um, for an average job search. And maybe you can even divide that up by seniority levels if you'd like. Yeah. Um, how much time should you give yourself? How much um, like processing, if you will, like, What's the end to end when you think about a candidate life cycle, if a change is going to be made? Impossible to answer. Okay. Uh, and you know why? Because the perfect opportunity, I, I, I could be working with someone right now and I would tell them that the search could take 30 days. It could take 12 months. Yeah. It's very much dependent upon what you want, uh, what industry you want to be in, what compensation structure you want to work around, what kind of environment, hybrid in the office, you know, on premise, what have you, virtual, you know. So uh, when when we understand the requirement of the individual, so, you know, we have to really understand their story and what they're looking for. Once we understand that, we can start recommend or making recommendations. I might have no recommendations for you based on what we've talked about in our conversation. Yeah. Right. I, I just, I just don't have anything. And then all of a sudden on Monday, I might be calling you saying, I, we just brought in a new client and this particular company is looking for this, this, and the other thing. Here's their website. Here's the job description. Do some research, see what your thoughts are. And they might come back and say, that sounds wonderful, Dan. Uh, I would like you to make an introduction. Or they might say, you know what? It's, this is still not the right fit for me. Great. No problem. Yeah. I, no need to force this. Let's just keep looking. And give me a sense of you, of the structure that you look to have. I mean, obviously there's the stuff on paper, the resume, the, have you done a certain job at a certain title at a certain growth stage for, you know, a company in a given industry mm-hmm. beyond that, what else? Yeah. So, well, for like a, for a BDR, it is, um, it's basically what their KPIs look like. You know, what are their activity metrics, uh, calls, outreach, LinkedIn, phone calls, emails, right? Cadences. What are you, you, you know, are you using outreach? What technology do you use? Are you using Salesforce? Um, so it's understanding what those metrics look like. And then it, it's trying to understand what their success is. Yeah. What has their success been? How have they done compared to those, those activity metrics? For a sales professional, it's average sales size, it's sales cycle, it's quota, it's percentage of the quota. Um, it is target audience. It is, um, you know, their sales type. Are they a hunter or a farmer? Are they looking for, you know, net new business or are they managing existing clients? Uh, so it's, there are so many different questions uh, based on what the role is, what level they're at. Um, it's compensation, it's base and variable comp. You know, it's this, this, it, every conversation we have to, I mean, the reason why, um, uh, companies use us is because there's so much heavy lifting yeah it's like for to figure out a sales background it's not you just don't look at the resume and say oh great i get it you have an idea but you gotta you have to talk to every single person yeah um and so for us it's a really we have a lot of conversations and we have to understand the person's background and for bdrs it's even harder Mm. because they don't, if they, especially if they're a recent college graduate, they, they have nothing on their background. Yeah. So the conversation, you're really digging, investing a lot of time in their background and their story to help them, even to help them figure out what some of their accomplishments have been in life. Right. Yeah. A lot of it, they leave off their resume because it's just basic things that have happened in their life. 
Sure. And we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. And then we have to educate them on what this even is. What is this role? What is it? You know, what's involved? And if you don't want to do these things, it's probably not good for you. Right. So uh, it's a, it's it's a, it's just the heavy lifting. And maybe that's why there's not a lot of exclusive. Maybe there's not. That's why there's not a lot of recruiting firms that just do sales. It's a lot of work. For sure. I'm curious if we were to kind of peel the onion a little deeper in the role that like if, if I were to broadly define it as SDR managers or SDR leaders, um, what are the kinds of things that you're looking at for that uh, cohort, for that segment, if you will? How do you mean? So if I'm, if, if I'm recruiting for kind of a director of sales development, yep. like what are, what are my criteria that I'm going to want to hand off to you? Um, if I'm thinking about this in the, in the best possible way for getting the best possible candidate, Give me some of the structure that I, I would want to place around that search. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Because do you know why? That is a difficult search. It is. It is a really difficult search. And the reason, I, I was just going to say, <laughs> I was going to say, why do you think that's a difficult search, Eric? Just in my, <laughs> right? Sure, that's yeah. the first thing I would say. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, let me peel this back. Uh, question the question. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I won't do that to you. Um, uh, the reason why it is such a difficult search is because the SDR function, the SDR manager function is whether uh, you wanna recognize it or not, it is people move on. There is a lot of turn, yeah. right? And so to find a person, when you get, when you become an SDR, you typically then become with an ultimate goal of becoming then a AE, right? You yep. wanna sell, if you're really good, you're either promoted and your sales managers are recruiting off your team or you're leaving and your competitors are picking you up or you're transitioning out into a different role. So to get the sales, to get the SDR manager, that's a really challenging position because the real question is, what is their next step yeah. and why do they want to move, right? So when we're talking to a company, the first thing I want to try to figure out is what are they trying to accomplish? And what are their expectations? Because most of them misunderstand how important the SDR manager role is and how <laughs> difficult it is at just to be that manager, but also to recruit that person, right? So it's not an inexpensive position. No. Right? It, In fact, one of the things, just to interrupt for yeah. a second, I've, I feel like I've seen, especially for SDR and then whatever leadership title, manager, director, VP, uh, in, I see that much more infrequently, but I see the most wide tide or uh, pay and comp variances yeah. on, around that particular yeah. like bucket, if you will, than just yeah. about anything in the sales department itself. Yeah. And by region. Yes. Yes. By region is, uh, it makes it even more challenging. So the, the, the reason why I said, uh, what are they trying to do? And then what are their expectations? Because what I'd first try to figure out is what do they expect from this search and who do they think they're going to recruit based on their comp structure, the amount of people on the team, how long the team has been in place, how much turnover it's had, mm -hmm. is it sustainable? There, there are so many different questions. Um, so th th those are the things I'd want to understand first. And then based on compensation, we would then want to talk through, are their requirements realistic? Yeah. Right. And then once we understand that the compensation is in, um, is competitive or at least average, uh, then we can understand what kind of, uh, le what level of experience we need. And the next question is, are there competitors that we're recruiting from? Mm -hmm. And who do you want to target for this? And sometimes they don't know. So, you know, we've, we've built technology to help companies gather data, understand the, the talent pool in the market, and then help them assess who they really want. And many times, while they all say they know what they're looking for, Eric, they don't. When they figure it out, they, they, they don't figure it out until we probably introduce them to five or six candidates. And now we have dialogue, there's feedback, they're telling us, you know, I like Mary, I like Joe, help me figure out and find more people with this experience. Yeah. And then you start to realize, oh, they asked for 10 years of experience, but in actuality, based on their comp, they can really, it's more like five to seven. 
yeah, and they right. want, you know, it's, it's so it, every, there's no silver bullet. I mean, what the reason why we most, we've been so successful is we ask so many questions up front, then we guide them through the search, then we produce the results they ask for, and that helps them figure out really what they need to grow their business. Well, and I was going to jokingly say, but there's a lot of truth in humor, <laughs> like good luck trying to find that director of sales development with 10 years of experience. Oh, unicorn. Right. 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 That's exactly right. Yes. yes <laughs> We've, exactly a few of our guests right. have, have fit that description, but otherwise yeah. like, yes, that person doesn't exist. No, no. Well, they exist. I'm um, sorry. Yeah. The person really doesn't exist, but, um, but we do help them figure out, you know, their inner internal HR team may need us because they can't get the point across and they say, all right, go to the pros They'll help right. us do this. And we sit down and by the way, we, we say the same thing before we kick off a search and these are the challenges. Now you can continue with, you know, talent uh, acquisition or, you know, try us out. We'll bring the talent to you. The question is, can you afford it? Are yeah. you willing to pay it? Can you sustain this person? Because I, I sure as heck don't want to, I'm not going to take somebody highly recommend your organization to find out that it's not a solid place for them to land and, and really build their career. That's a great answer because what I'm really hearing here, and again, forgive me for being so brusque, but it's almost like telling or or negotiating with the hiring company, what are you willing to settle for? You know, like what's most important to you, um, given that probably time, money, and resources are not unlimited, and I can't just <laughs> go get the all-star of all yeah. all-stars <laughs> with an unlimited budget. Well, you know, it's... it's uh... <laughs> This is, gonna, this is gonna sound so cheesy, but it's like a like a house hunter show, right? You know, you know, someone says, "Oh, I, you know, I want this house, and I want to pay this amount of money, and I want to be a mile from the schools and downtown." And so those shows, the first house they show them is like two hundred thousand dollars over their budget, but it has everything exactly everything they want. Then the right. next house is like run down, and it's like fifty miles away from town. And it's under their budget, but it needs to be fixed up, right? And then the, yep. the middle one, the third one, is a it's a it's middle ground between all of those things, and they they're happy and they figure it out, and now they understand the market and and what's right for them. Yeah, a good analogy, and uh, one that's probably less fraught with emotion than comparing people in the same exact yeah. way. <laughs> you know, and I don't, I don't want to sound like cheesy or anything. That's not what we do. I mean, we're, we're, we're changing people's lives, right? Sure. We have a goal to change 6,000 people's lives by 2029. We, we, and, and we're not, we're not doing it like as a, you know, big commercial organization. We genuinely are invested in a, in, 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 in the sales community. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we help BDRs and SDRs and over their life, you know, over their career, we continue to help advance their careers and grow. And it's wonderful. It's just like, it's awesome. It really. Yeah. Is. I think that that's probably maybe the most rewarding part of the job, isn't it? Where you can help somebody from like, not cradle to grave, but literally in their career arc, you know, a number of stops along the way. Cause sales is typically a, 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 a career path that has a lot of transitions, not yeah. just on the SDR side. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, for sure. But the SDR side, you know, for SDR managers, uh, one of the biggest things to be a successful SDR manager, uh, one of the biggest things to acknowledge is that you are going to have turn. It's, you're going to turn people over, not intentionally. You might have the right. best environment in the world, but they're going to leave. And so uh, in order to be effective, it's not about just ramping up an SDR team, right? That's super fun. It's about yeah. at year one, when people start dropping off and leaving, it's sustaining it. It's not just growing it, but then how do you sustain it? That's the that's really the, the critical success factor. Well, and, and going into the now, again, we're recording this in Q1 of 2023. One of the things that, that we're seeing on the landscape too is, different industries moving at a completely different speed. So for instance, in the tech industry, we've seen and heard a ton of layoffs, including entire SDR teams, right? Like that entire function and department just getting wiped out. Whereas if you look at the macroeconomic environment and our unemployment rate here in America, it's like, what, 3.4%? Oh, yeah. Or something ridiculously low, generationally low. Yeah. 
yeah, we're still, I mean, we're obviously we're a niche player, so we're super busy. Yeah. Right. Um, but well, I, I take that back. We're not as busy as we were over the past two years, but we're still <laughs> super busy. Um, uh, but, and I just dropped my thoughts. So <laughs> uh, it's all right. <laughs> No worries. I was I was just making the point that like we're in a in an economic environment that is very uneven, oh, and yeah. some industries are just they seem to be moving at different speeds with different agendas. For instance, like venture back startups seem to be fewer, especially compared to twenty twenty one when it seemed like anyone and their mother could raise like twenty million dollars on a Series A for <laughs> God knows what reason. But like yeah. the the point there is is that environment has changed dramatically. Well, you know, so we obviously were heavy in technology. I mean, we're super heavy. We work with a lot of PE and VC backed companies and the partners, many times they use us for their, the different portfolio companies and they drop us in, they have a playbook and we build out whatever team they need, SDR, AE, enterprise, it, all of the above. But there are so many companies, so, you know, Three, four years ago, three years ago, I would say that um, the SDR world is just kind of maybe four, maybe even more, probably four, like five years ago, but the SDR world exploded. Yeah. Right? It just exploded. And you saw it all originally in tech, but now look at all the B2B companies, right? Just B2B, out, excluding tech companies. We have tons of companies that are coming in that are building out SDR teams that are not <laughs> software companies or SaaS right. organizations, right? Even from the VC world, right? They might have a B2B company that's taking off and they've adopted the same model. Yeah. So while some big tech firms might be laying off, there are still so many other companies that people just don't know about. Like we work with companies of all sizes, but pre-revenue to 150 million is probably our sweet spot. Mm -hmm. There are so many companies out there like that that people just don't know about. They can't even find them. And the, those companies have the same issue, right? No one knows who they are. They, have a, they don't have the brand. Yeah. People just don't know who they are. So th that is, that's kind of some of the value we add. We just for both the candidate and the client, we just, we have access to really talent, hidden, really strong hidden talent. And for the candidates, we have same, we have access to companies that they just don't know about. And tell me a little bit more about that kind of like access or being the matchmaker in the middle of any kind of deal that goes down. Um, as you mentioned before, you know, this is changing people's lives. Um, we spend arguably more time at work than we do at home or uh, sleeping for that matter, if you were to divide up most people's days yeah. into thirds. And so it's obviously a very important part of our lives. Um, and yet it's so, I don't want to say poorly understood, but, but it almost feels like that when, when you talk to most people about how do you manage your career? You know, the, the best, oh, I don't know. I I'm so biased. Like I wish, I wish I had someone like me when I started, ah, <laughs> I okay. had no, I just didn't know what, I, you know, I, I had no idea. And most, a lot of kids that get out of college, they have no idea what they want to do, right? What's next. And then after that, when you are in your career, there, there are many people that just get stuck and they just, they just, they get promoted and they follow a path. The only ones that really ever get to see the, the, the variety of opportunity is like a, a third party or, or, or like a, if you talk to a company like ours, we look at your background and we say, okay, you're thinking about moving industries. Okay, what are we going to leverage? What are the strengths? What is the plan? What is the strategy? Or what are the, you know, you want to move into software? Great. What are the apps that you're using? What does your industry use? What is our plan moving forward? And what key performance, same thing, what KPI, what key performance indicators are we going to use for you to be successful in your search? Right. And so I think many times you need a, a third party or you need a, you know, you need some consultation just to understand what your options are. Because without that consultation, you only see many times you just see one path and you have the blinders on. And it's all about, you know advancing in your current situation, but you might find that your particular industry 
it just never pays as well as you want it to be, as well as you want. And I know because I've met a ton of people in that industry and this is the most money you're ever going to make. If you stay in it, it's fine, but you're not going to hit the goals or the financial goals that you're looking for. So you'll need to pivot, hopefully before you've been in it too long. That's really interesting. So what you're presenting is, is kind of an idea that like, there are people that like yourself that know the market way more than you could ever hope to. And sometimes the best moves might even be lateral moves. They might be adjacent moves. They might be moves you never even considered to unlock the true commission, like compensation potential um, of your sales career. Yeah. Maybe a lot of people just get lost. They just, they just don't know. And they haven't talked to anyone. It's, it's the same as we just mentioned it. Companies, and when we first get started with a company, they, they say they know exactly what they want, but usually 99% of the time that changes a bit as they get into the search and they realize what kind of talent we can introduce to them. It just, it all starts to change and what, what that costs, by the way. It's the same thing for the candidate. When they start to understand what options they're qualified for and what kinds of companies they could consider, it, it opens up that, you know, it's, it's an open horizon to new opportunities that they've never considered before. And now they start to think, okay, and they may have a goal to stay in their industry. They may have a goal to switch. They, you know, there's all kinds of things that start to happen as they start to brainstorm, build a plan and the strategy to move forward in their career. How do you, as, as kind of the, you know, the head honcho at Treeline, how do you coach those companies and, and, what you described to me was a change management process, Hmm. right? Like they come with thinking Hmm. one thing and they're going to leave, hopefully satisfied, get to those moments that you defined earlier, where you do find that perfect fit. Everyone's happy. It's a win-win scenario. Help me understand like some of the change management that you do with your clients and with your um, candidates. Yeah. The, so, well, let's, let's start with the, the clients it's hard. It's really hard because most of the people we work with, they've been recruiting. They've been in the industry for years. They're sure they are a, a VP of sales has been a top producer, likely at many companies. They have a process. They understand and they know what they want to do. Yeah. Um, so when we sit down and talk with them, unfortunately, what happens, not, not unfortunately, but they have a, a specific understanding as to how they want their process to work, how it's worked in the past. Uh, and what they're looking for. And so it's, it's, so it's not just what they're looking for, right? It's about process uh, because the market's always changing. Yeah. And right now, if you're not moving with tremendous speed and you have a million different, pro, you know, even a million different, let's say you have 10 steps and two tests or two assessments, two mm-hmm. assessments, um, you will lose every A candidate and end up hiring C or D candidates because they're the only ones that are going to stay in the process. Mm-hmm. So we, I, we, I would have that conversation and I would say, and I would, I would be very honest. And I'd say, if we don't change this, we will not be effective in this search and we won't be able to produce the results you want. We don't want to invest the time in a search in the search to bring you, you know, a half dozen A candidates that you can't capitalize or hire because the process is broken, right? We just need to understand that. Secondly, if this is the requirement we're looking for, we're telling you that your compensation plan is not competitive. Right. If we bring you this, this, these individuals, can you and will you, are you willing to increase your compensation structure? And if the answer is yes, we're, we're, willing, to, to, we're, we're willing to consider it, then we will hold you accountable because when we bring that can- those candidates to you, we are going to introduce you and tell you what their compensation structure expectations are. I think I mentioned to you earlier, this is, we are fully transparent. The candidate knows what the comp structure range is coming in and so doesn't the client. They understand everything. There should be no hiccups along the way, yeah. unless you're playing games. And if you're playing games, you're probably not a great, you're probably not a great client for us. Yeah. So if you understand the comp structure and we're in agreement, and we bring you the talent you want, you'll pay this compensation plan. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, we'll bring that can- those candidates to you. And if we do that, and for every candidate, they're too expensive, then the next thing we have to figure out is then we need to drop the requirement. And so it doesn't always happen in a conversation, 
but we would be very honest and set accurate expectations up front, Eric, to make sure that they're crystal clear that if they use our service, we will deliver what they ask. But in order to find success for both for all, all three parties, they have to they they have to be genuine and authentic with what they're telling us around comp and experience and making a hire. You know, it, it, it almost is reminiscent of the example you brought up earlier where, you know, when you meet with a real estate agent to list your house, yeah. <laughs> you have that right. inevitable right. conversation around what's fair, what's a good comp structure yeah. in the market, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes they have to see the candidates and the compensation. So we, we show- the, Time on market have, right there. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we show all of this information. We are not wasting anyone's time. Our, our yeah. hires happen in 30 days or less. That's what we do. Yeah. And so if, if we're in a conversation, Eric, and it doesn't seem like this is possible, we will not take the search. We just won't. I've been doing this for too long <laughs> to right. take on a bad search. We won't do it, right? Yeah. Um, but if someone's trying to figure it out and learn, We'll work with you to help you figure it out. We'll introduce you to candidates. And as you go, you might say, you guys are bringing us awesome candidates. We can't afford them. Then let's reduce the requirement or let's, you know, let's change something here. Um, but uh, we're not going to hire you an A candidate if you can't pay the compensation plan that's required for an A candidate. That's pretty fair. Um, let's switch it to the other side because I'm curious. And I think maybe those in the audience might be really curious as well. If... Um, if you want to attract um, the likes of a recruiter, if you want more kind of like traffic or eyeballs or folks on your LinkedIn profile, um, what are some of the things that the candidates should be thinking about doing to just have better visibility um, for opportunities to come, come their way? Yeah, that's a great, really good question. I mean, the first thing is use a basic title, right? I mean, Whatever crazy title you've been given, change <laughs> change it so people know what you do, like business development representative, sales representative, account executive. I mean, look look at the most highly searched terms, right? What are the key, what are the most successful keywords to your title? And it's like business development rep or sales development rep or account executive or enterprise AE or, you know, make sure it's simple and easy to understand. Yeah. Then you can get found. But if you have a crazy title, you, you just, you can't get found. You know, I, I can tell you our recruiters won't be able to find you. That makes perfect sense. And I see a lot more of that these days or omitting the title in, entirely on LinkedIn in service of like, I don't know, talking about what you do for your clients or how you do it. Um, like it's almost in the wrong place. Well, it's two things going on. I mean, are you, are you using the title to sell or are you using the title to get found? Right. Right. I mean, it all depends. If you're looking for an opportunity, then use a common title so people can find you. And if you're, because otherwise, otherwise you can't, you can't, you, you won't be found, you, yeah. you know, you just won't be found. Yeah. And, and discoverability is probably like what more than 90% of the battle, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yep. What, what else are your recruiters on, you know, kind of like looking for, you know, thinking about when, when they're assessing a, a new candidate for, for you. For Treeline to hire for Treeline or to hire for one of our clients. One of your clients. Um, but okay. I would actually love the, the Treeline too. Cause a lot of people probably don't even think about getting into recruiting. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know what? Uh, a lot of crossover there it's too. More, oh, mentioned. it's yeah, it's it is it's definitely 100% sales. We 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 function like any our recruiting team functions like any software sales team, any SaaS sales, sales team. Sure, that's exactly how we work. But um, so can you ask the question again uh, in regards to the company? Yeah, I'm just thinking about all the folks that might be out there listening to this podcast, kind of grooving on what you're saying and, and thinking about their own careers and their own, you know, like, I think we we all get a little bit of an ego boost when we have recruiters come our way and they kind of rattle our cage and say, hey, you know, like, we think that you would be a good fit for X. Um, and I'm curious to to know what somebody might do 
aside of like the kind of like normal things that you would immediately think about, like, oh yeah, use a normal title or basic title. <laughs> yeah. Right. Great yeah. face palm obvious like suggestion, but a lot of people don't. And they're they're like, oh right. yeah, should have thought of that. Um, right. what else? Yeah, I think the um when so on your let's just use LinkedIn because likely you're probably being sought out by somebody on LinkedIn. You could be, well, let's say you're, let's say you're not actively searching, yeah. right? You're just kind of selectively, or you just want to be found, what have you. So the next thing we're looking for is consistency, right? We're looking for, so the first thing is the title. Mm-hmm. The second, well, the first thing is, the first thing is really a competitor probably. So we're going after what companies you've worked at. The second thing is then does the title align? The third thing then is consistency in your career, in your, in your resume. And so in some cases, um, someone might have jumped jobs. Like for example, uh, you know, SDRs, they move yep. quite regularly. So you might see that they've jumped, but there you see a story and some consistency around growth. And so you'll talk to that person because you really want to understand why you want to understand the story for a more senior level person. It's the same thing. If they've jumped, it's okay. We want to understand why we want to understand what the concern, what we think we're anticipating, what the concerns will be from our client. And so we're trying to understand, is your story legit? Is it strong? You know, do we believe it? And are we going to put our name on your candidacy and make a high recommendation that a company should talk to you or not. So it's like the consistency in your resume and story. Yeah. And, and if I'm thinking about this, right, what you're describing is in that experience section on LinkedIn, it's, it's consistency, but also providing maybe another C word, the context around the role, why you, why you were in it, why you moved there, why you like went in this direction. um, So that somebody from the outside looking in can go, ah, got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so true. For, and for us, uh, we look for the same thing. We, t- we talk to a lot of people um, for us and for our clients. And one of the things I do um, for, you know, anyone listening to this is I look at your posts. Yeah. I, I will go and I'll look at your posts and I'll see what you're posting, what you're liking, what you're sharing, the relevance of it. Um, that, that, in itself, just um, that tells a lot yeah. for me. For me, it does. And what kind of value judgments do you make um, based on those posts? Talk candidly or, or transparently about what, what you think are really strong um, posts or likes or shares and what are maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Negatives. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, any, 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 um, you know, any posts that are anything positive, like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> promoting other companies or technology or solutions or uh, well-being. I, I don't care. Anything, anything positive is uh, what I'm looking for personally. And then uh, anything way off track is if all of the posts are more social in nature as opposed to professional. Yeah, got it. Turn off. Yeah. So like the social media ification, oftentimes we forget LinkedIn's a social network, but right. um, cause it's got that business veneer and right. it, it almost feels like, tell me if I'm crazy. It almost feels like LinkedIn in this chapter of their evolution wants to push toward more towards that social element. Yeah, doesn't I, it? Yeah. And that those, I mean, you're looking at like, uh, you know, uh, when you're looking at all levels of candidates, if they're a CRO or a VP or enterprise, I don't manager, what have you. If you look at their post, they might not post a lot, but the posts are relevant. It might be a press yeah. release, or it's a, a you know someone that's expanding, a, you know, a, a new job as a VP. Wh- whatever it is, there's all of these positives. It might be um, quote positive quotes, what have you. If it's all like social not as professional it's, it's hard to look at that person and be serious right it's hard to yeah. look at them and say are they a business professional or are they you know using linkedin as a uh, 
you know, it's just a social tool. Yeah, that said, I, I see a lot of folks kind of having their own awakening for expressing themselves and, and getting a lot of like engagement and comments just by being that. Yeah. I don't know. Exposing yeah. the personal side of them. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just something that I do. It's almost like, a, yeah, just understand what their, you know, likes are and interests and, you know, things of that nature. That's fascinating. Well, Dan, this has been a whirlwind of, of a discussion. We've covered so much ground and I want to re-emphasize. Um, so maybe we can give people the opportunity to, where should they go to find you, find Treeline? Um, how should they get in touch? Yeah, I, well, if they, if they want to find me, they can find me on LinkedIn, Dan Fantasia, or they could email me. It's, it's pretty simple. My email is my last name. It's Fantasia at Treeline Inc. That's I-N-C, treelineinc.com. And then uh, our website is treelineinc.com or just search Treeline Inc. on um on LinkedIn. And if you want, just follow us there. We have you know plenty of blogs and um, jobs and <laughs> information, anything you need. Here we go. Hopefully we can add to some of that uh, spiking traffic yeah. with uh, <laughs> new folks that hadn't heard of Treeline before, but maybe do now. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. You bet. Well, this is a real pleasure. Fun, fun conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You are wonderful. Very, very kind. And uh, I appreciate your time.